So I have some amazing and wonderful individuals with me, both experts in communication, whether they are, they have chosen this as their field of, um, of um, their, their study field or if they're parents who have just really um, taken in and really taken this, the process of communication and learned so much about it. We have a little bit of everyone today. So instead of me introducing each person, I think um, uh, Becky Burdine has some slides she's going to show, and I've asked each one of them to introduce themselves. So I'm not sure which slide is first, but whoever's first maybe on this slide, uh, I'll have them go first if you guys want to unmute yourself and introduce yourselves. Can you see the slides? Yes, we can. Okay, so let's go to the first one. Awesome, Carol, you get to go first. Sure, hi everyone, I'm Carol Sangari, um, a speech language pathology professor in South Florida where it is lightning like crazy. So if you oh, hear no. any big booms, <laughs> it's the no. lightning alarm going off at the local uh, middle school. Um, I'm a speech language pathologist by profession and I've pretty much spent my entire career doing AAC work. So I'm just so happy to be uh, invited to join all of you today. Wonderful, thank you. I can't hear you, Tabby, for some reason. Oh. We'll work on Tabby's microphone. Maybe go to the next person and we'll work with Tabby here and see what's going on. There we go. So my name is Sarah. I am a mom to three kids and my oldest is 12 who lives with Angelman syndrome, Hannah. And I am a teacher and a parent. Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. It's great to be with you today. I'm Karen Hurst. I also have three children. Uh, my oldest is Nico. You can see him here. Uh, he is almost 10 years old um, and he has Angelman syndrome. And Nico has seven year old twin brothers. Uh, and so we get into a lot of fun and silliness uh, and adventures. And um, I, I work in uh, the labor movement uh, when I am not doing my parenting and partnership with school teams and, uh, you know, caregiving and all of the other stuff. It's great to be with you. Awesome. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm... Um, Becky Bernheim. I am a professor in molecular biology, and I'm also mom to these two kids. I realized I don't have any pictures of me with my kids because I always take the pictures, but this one we have. <laughs> um, I have a remote here, and basically we took about 70 pictures because we were trying to get one for a Christmas card where she was actually looking at the camera and not, not at one of us, which all of you probably appreciate. But this is my daughter, Sophie. She's about to turn 16, which I can't believe. Uh, and uh, she has Angelman syndrome, and this is her younger brother, Donovan, who does not have Angelman syndrome and is probably the more difficult of the two. <laughs> Thank you. Tabby, let's see if we can hear you. Not yet. Not sure what's going on. So we will continue to work with Tabby because we were we heard you this morning. Tabby and, and Becky have already done a session for us today already. So thank you for that. But so we'll work, keep working with Tabby here, but I want to jump right into it. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm so thankful that we're doing this panel today because I think the one thing as a parent for an individual with Angelman syndrome, the communication journey is the one that terrifies me the most. And it's the one that I'm like really smack dab in right now. So I would, I would love to start off with the parents, you know, the parents on the panel, um, maybe talk a little bit about how you started your journey um into this you know the communication world and and then for the panelists I'd love for to hear some tips from you all on how to get started um or best practices around getting started so whoever wants to jump in I'll let uh maybe we'll start with Sarah and go with Karen and Becky and then go from there sure um so Hannah is 12 years old right now and how we kind of got started with communication was, um, hmm, I'm trying to think of how, how this actually started. <laughs> because 
in the middle or at the beginning years, you're just in survival mode, right? You don't really necessarily know exactly what you're doing, what you're supposed to be doing. And you're leaning on every professional that tells you the littlest glimpse of anything you are holding on to. Um, I think as a teacher, I had a little bit more hindsight of what I wanted to see happen and where I wanted to see her go. And maybe that opened my eyes a little bit sooner. Um, it wasn't until though I, I went to conferences like this, I went to Angelman Syndrome conferences and connected and really listened to professionals of what others were doing and kind of tried to see like who I aligned with um, personally. And that's when I knew like I paid attention more to them. Um, then as Karen and Becky will tell you, um, we went to, um, well, I went to a conference in 2014 to in Ottawa, Angelman Syndrome Conference, and I cornered Erin Sheldon, and because I had listened to her and Mary Louise talk about communication and um, using sign language and all these things of how sign language could be limiting, because I know we all start with that. And I remember cornering her and being like, okay, tell me more though, like it is limiting her. We're kind of hitting a wall and she's four, there's there's more to it there's there's got to be more and she said can you come back here in two weeks for the very first Angelman conference or the very first Angelman camp and she's like we don't even know if it's a go yet and kind of there and I was like we will be there we will come across the country and we'll figure this out because I, I knew in my heart I needed support professionally or personally like in this space I needed the immersion support and um, I lit, we literally fundraised and I showed up to camp with an iPad in my hand, in the box, wrapped up. And I was like, here you go. Help. <laughs> Help anything. And um, it changed my world. But what really changed my world in a lot of ways was being in the space or seeing other people. And now the beautiful part of social media is you can see all this videos and pictures um, that wasn't there when like in 2014, but I watched this one family that um, Hannah was a lot like him and he was about four years older than Hannah and I watched him and I watched his mom and I watched their family kind of interact and I thought, wow, I could see Hannah, like that's Hannah in four years, like, mm -hmm. okay, that's awesome, that's great, she's doing it, the mom is rocking it, this is great and that's what really propelled me on my communication journey of beliefs of like how aligning myself with someone or to see someone just a few years ahead um, to say like, okay, now I can see what's happening. Now I can see a little bit more of a picture yeah. because when they're, when you're first starting out, it's cloudy, right? You don't necessarily know um, like in our neurotypical kids, I know what's going to happen at the end of grade one. I know what they're going to look like at the end sure. of grade one. With Hannah, I was like, what is this going to look like? How can I support her? And really being around those families changed my communication journey, my beliefs, how I saw Hannah, how I supported Hannah, and the support that I knew that I craved. So long story okay. short, sorry. No, and I like, I, I like, before we move on, I like the idea, or you made a comment about you aligned with someone that you felt personally connected to, because I do think with communication, there's so many different and diverse and various ways that our individuals with Angelman syndrome are learning. And mm -hmm. so, you know, sometimes when we look on YouTube, like Facebook or whatever, we're like, oh, that's exactly what I need to do, but it may not work well for Jackson. So I mm -hmm. love the idea, the, the, the statement you made about, you know, you wanted to align with someone or a group of people that you connected with personally. So thank you for sharing that. Karen, maybe pass on to you. Great. Um, so as I was thinking about this question, I was taken back in time to uh, the early days. So Nico got his diagnosis right before he turned two. Um, and uh, literally a week later, I found out I was pregnant with twins. Um, <laughs> Gosh. And uh, so that was a real like whew, uh, right? way to rock my world. And, um, and so, you know, Nico had been in speech therapy and had been, we'd been doing stuff, but we, it was just, you know, very early on. And I basically did nothing until after the twins were born because I wasn't able to really process anything besides like, I got to get these babies 
on the other side. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And at, after that, um, you know, I spent, I spent a bunch of time, uh, you know, I'd been, been reading and thinking and, and gotten uh, to connect with some er- early on in my AS journey um, as a mom with other, other families like, and, and leaders like Aaron Sheldon, Mary Louise Bertram, who Sarah talked about, um, I knew I wanted to, we needed to find some sort of um, AAC system for Nico. So I'm, I'm a, a, I'm the kind of person who was like, okay, let's make a spreadsheet. Um, So I (laughs) did all the research, made a spreadsheet comparing all the different options of AAC and like what's good about them and what's not. And should, you know, like all of this (laughs) stuff, right. Here's how I ended up making, here's how we ended up making the decision as a family. It wasn't because the spreadsheet gave us the answer um, because it didn't. Because all the systems that are like robust systems are good systems. And what it came down to for for me and for our family was what could I see myself using? Yeah. And in my life situation. So I had I had six month old twins. I had a two and a half year old (laughs) who clearly needed a way to communicate what was going on in his life. And I chose a AAC system um, that I found really intuitive to program that I um, really liked, uh, that it was really easy to use um, and find where things were. It had really easy search function, which did not exist in a bunch of systems back then. Now, a lot of systems have that built in. And that's how I made the choice. I was like, which one of these do I feel most comfortable with? And can I see really growing with Nico? And that to me was the biggest thing. It's like, which one are we gonna do? I feel like I can use because I understand that so much about helping Nico communicate is about him being immersed in that and seeing us do that communication as well. Yeah. So that was how I decided. That's how I, um, this was a family decision, um, (laughs) but I was sort of in the lead uh, for our family on it. And that's really where we got started on the journey. And then like Sarah Um, We showed up a few weeks later to this uh, Angelman communication and literacy camp. Um, And, uh, and, and I really just want to echo what Sarah said about the importance of having other folks on the journey with you, Mm -hmm. other parents, other families, other um, professionals who are with you uh, and, and can help support and learn together and also complain together and, and um, strategize together and all that stuff. Absolutely. Well, and I love what you you said that at the end of the day, you you chose a device that you could see yourself using because it is. I think for us, the most scary thing um, possible is um, me trying to actually use a device. You know, my Baden, my twin, my twin boy does it wonderfully, and Jackson's getting there. But for me, I'm like, ah. So I love the idea of that, and I, I agree, Becky. I think I just saw. It sounds like we need to get these camps back up and going. So we'll see what we can do through the foundation to make that happen. But Becky, I'm gonna go ahead and. Yeah, right. Oh, I hear you, Tab. I hear you, Tabby. Perfect. Good. So Becky, go ahead and why don't you share? Um. So. There's some similarities and some differences. So my, my daughter, Sophie, um, has always been really strongly affected by Angelman syndrome, especially in her gro- gross motor and fine motor. So she still doesn't walk, for example. So I was listening to Mary Louise and Aaron when we started on a listserv. This was before Facebook, believe it or not. Um, and I knew that our kids could communicate if you gave them the right tools. And so I spent a lot of those early years in a panic because I'm like, my kid needs tools and she needs to communicate and she can't because all she does is hold her hands like this. Like, what am I going to do? And and, um, and I got really hung up on what was the right thing to do. Like, what was the perfect thing to do? Mm-hmm. Um, because I was afraid I was going to make the wrong decision and we were going to waste even more time. Right. And, um, and I think, I, I think I've sent it to you, Amanda, but if I haven't, I will, you know, Mary Louise ended up writing this big, beautiful post about calming down and not stressing out and just being where you are. Um, And I was really pushing with her school team at the time that she needed to really communicate, but I didn't want her just doing picture exchanges. I wanted like communication. And they kind of patted me on the head like, yeah, good mom. Um, And the thing that ended up working for us that was so serendipitous was that they brought out a Big Mac button because they were like, this is what she can handle. And it broke my heart, but I'm like, okay, let's start with the Big Mac button. And the first time she hit it and a voice came out of it, she went absolutely berserk. She lost her mind. 
And for the next four years, if she entered a room, she would scan. And if she saw a Big Mac button, she would lose her mind and they'd have to remove her from the room. So Big Mac buttons were off the calendar. I mean, we couldn't use them. And I was kind of like, yay, you know, <laughs> I'm sorry, it traumatized her so badly. Um, but, you know, once she started to see the power of if I do this, I can get things. Or if I do this, I can make people leave me alone. That's a big mm-hmm. motivator for us to yeah. stop doing things. Um, she really sort of took to it. And what we actually had to do is I had to just say, everyone says she can't do it. And I'm just going to buy her a device and I'm going to put something on it. I'm going to put a key guard on it. I'm going to hand it to her. And for a long time, that child with her hand, just like this, figured out a way to use the side of her thumb to hit the keys to say Mm -hmm. what she wanted to say. She still doesn't have a pointer, but she can maneuver really well. And I spent such a long time before I felt before I even gave her the chance to try because I just thought she can't like she can't do what all these other kids do that camp was key for that it was good for me to see all the other kids I know there was one moment where um a mom who's not on the panel right now but she and I ended up having a moment where we basically cried on each other because her son was nonstop. he just moved constantly just ran all over the place and you know Sophie was in her wheelchair and at one point I was sitting out on the porch and I had him under one arm and Sophie under the other and we were swinging And she came out and she said, I see how you look at my son. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, I see the look in your eyes. And she's like, you're so envious of what he can do. Mm. And I said, yeah, I am. And she said, and I look at your daughter who sits and listens and pays attention and doesn't run around. And all I can think of is why can't my kid be like her? Mm. And we both cry. I mean, like, it, it it was so nice to see other kids who were so different, like, you know, different strengths and realize all of them deserve to have a chance and we had to figure out how to meet them where they were as opposed to trying to figure out how to make all of them fit into the same strategy yeah so that was a big thing for me it's a beautiful story and I love I think it's really important to 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 you know put out there as you don't always have to look for the perfect thing the craziest most you know unique and um out of the box thing made be what works for you. So I love that. I love that story. So for our, um, so for our specialists and our experts on the field, um, how, what kind of tips would you give to our families listening around um, right now about getting started? Tabby, do you want to go first and then Carol? Uh, sure. I just want to oh, say that. Um, oh, oh, look at this. Just a minute. We have someone who wants to say hi to everyone and look what he just <laughs> brought me. Look what he just brought me. He brought me one of his cards. He said, like, Let's all say yay. He said like. He brought me his card. What do you like, the pretty girl? Hi, Jackson. Sorry. Hi, Jackson. Okay. That was take... so clever. Right. Okay. Go ahead, Tabby. <laughs> um, I just want to say that I think that um, I, I don't know that I consider myself an expert because I am constantly always still learning. And I think that family is really valuable for us to learn from. So I just want to put that out there. But I think when you're getting started, I love the idea of just I think that there's a certain amount of fear that a lot of families fear about, am I going to get it right? How do I get started? How do I do it? Like, what does perfect look like? And just kind of releasing that fear and, and just, it's okay. Awkward is okay. It all feels awkward when you're taking a visual language and mapping it to an intent and a, and a meaning and, and trying to make meaning out of pictures. So um, the awkward is okay and, and be okay with it. <laughs> um, that, that doableness. I would also say like you're in it for the long game. So you want to make it as doable as possible. Don't feel like it has to be all, all, all in all the time because you're going to lose your steam and that's not really going to serve you or your child. And the last thing I would say is that connection is absolutely key. So don't sacrifice the learning, the, um, the touching the button for the connection, like that authentic kind of mm-hmm. relationship piece that, that is really um, so I mean, it's really the centerpiece of, of that human experience and your relationship yeah. with your child. I love that. And I love that um, your comment about being all in at all times. I think as, as parents, we constantly feel like any moment that we're breathing and our child's in front of us, we need to be doing a therapy. We need to be doing something. And that can be very, um, very hard on the caregiver. And and you can really beat yourself up as a parent. And those moments that you say, you know what, I'm just not going to do it today. And then you, you doubt yourself. You go to bed and think, I just didn't do enough. And so I love that it's okay that sometimes you just can't, you don't have to be in all the time, right? So thanks for sharing that. So Carol, I'd love to hear from you. 
Sure. Well, I, I mean, I loved hearing um, the stories that Sarah and Karen and um, Becky shared um, because, I mean, it it's kind of speaks to my gut um, in this, in that, like, there's a lot of right ways to do this. Right. <laughs> right? Like, everybody did it, like, got into this, like, with a different on-ramp, you know, whether it was a spreadsheet or just, like, digging in in other ways. And I would say that would be my number one bit of advice. It's like, whatever feels, whatever low fruit, you know, that's hanging that you can reach, just pluck it. It's as right. sweet as the stuff on the top, you know, so, you know, don't, don't, don't sort of feel that, you know, you, things have to be done in a set sequence, you know, is there, you know, an ideal way of doing it? Well, probably in a perfect world, there is, you know, none of us live there. So what's the point of even <laughs> like, you know, like knowing that, you know, I think there's just, you know, I think of this more like a starfish, like, like you could, you could take this in any direction and help your kid grow in terms of their communication, their language and literacy. So, you know, you know, if you kind of get into that place where you're like, oh, I'm supposed to do this, you know, if that starts to feel paralyzing, think, okay, well, if I can't do that, what else could I do? Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, just pick up on that for a little bit. So I love that. I think it kind of goes well, goes into um, our, our next question here. And Becky kind of talked about this a little bit. I think one of the things that's either really challenging or can be really supportive is when we move into working with others when it comes to our communication journey, whether it's a school team, whether it's our therapist, whether it's even our own like extended family, right? Like what this looks like in, in you know, how you partner with your school teams when you're moving into that, you know, that communication journey. So I'd love to hear from, from you all about how, you know, your tips on, or, you know, what your experiences have been, whether good or bad, because I think we can learn from both on how you're working with your school teams and your other teams when it comes to communication. Sarah, maybe you want to start off since you have a, a whole session or a whole class around this when it comes to your communication bundle. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It, oh man, it's so insightful to hear from everyone else. And I think we're saying the same things as like, just jump in. We've all lost sleep over all of this. We're mm -hmm. still losing sleep over this. And Amen. we're going into junior high, Hannah's grade seven this year. We're going into nine teachers, plus consultants, plus therapists, plus admin. And I get to talk to one person if they want to talk to me, right? Like it's, it's, the, we're at the mercy of the system, which can be super scary to hand over our kid and say, are you, do, you're the extension of me. Are you fulfilling and implementing the vision that we're all trying to take steps? Because I'm here year after year. This is the long game for me. And you are here for a year. So how I kind of approach teams, like school teams as that is, I, first of all, I always say, you might think I'm an expert in my child, but I am not an expert. I do not have a manual. I know her really well-ish, but she's changing as much as I'm changing. And so I do not expect you to be the expert in teaching her as well. We are a team, so we need to relax our shoulders, drop our egos, and share information. And so when we're working with school teams, um, yeah, like over the years, I created a communication bundle and that's what um, like my classes are because I believe that we need to share information, we need to gather information, we need to share information, and then we kind of come together in the common concerns. But knowing that like when we're gathering information, we're just gathering we're just, it's not necessarily, it's data and it's kind of capturing, but we're not assessing on that information. We're just gathering. The information that we're sharing with each other is pertinent information. So as a family, it's important to write your vision, become clear in a vision and, and all that. However, if I walk into the school and say, here's my two page vision, they already believe in your vision. They, we're all service providers. We all love kids. We want the best. So I think when we're sharing information, we need to think of what information is pertinent to share with the school teams. What information do they need to know? And as much as diagnosis is so important, it's more important to lead with strategies and supports. Here is what my daughter is good at. Here's the best way to support her. Here is our... Um, 
our best practices or whatever, what we've learned and gathering information from everyone on the team to, to put together this bundle, to put together this info. So we're gathering all perspectives. Um, that's your vision in the implementation. That's how we implement the vision and play the long game, right? We, mm-hmm. we ask people to join our team and gather their information as we go from year to year and build on those blocks. And so I really try, I, my three things in some ways is like, I front load the school and the EAs. I give them and share information that is pertinent that they would need to know right now. And it's a fine line, right? You don't give too much, but you don't want to give too little. And everyone's tapped out in May and June and everyone's running 150 miles an hour in September. So it's finding that link, right? Of like, where can I give you this information that you can take it in when you're thinking about my child because as a teacher you're thinking about these kids at two o'clock in the morning you're thinking about these kids constantly right so having that point to say how can i share this information that it's available when you're ready to receive it and then i really go towards peers and community and, and building that up so there's the front loading eas the schools and then um, educating peers and and community and really um, supporting yourself in that. Absolutely, and and just just in case some of you have you some of you have asked, I know we're, we will. The ASF has been supporting people to go through this communication bundle. So stay tuned for more. I think you're right in the middle of a session right now, but we have a few more coming. So some really great points. Any any more perspective from anyone else on the panel about um, partnering with your with your teams? Becky? So I was just going to add that um, one thing that's really helped me, I'm a teacher too, and, you know, being able to, I borrowed a phrase from Aaron, and, you know, being able to walk into the school team and say, like, you know, Sophie's on a 50-year literacy plan, and yeah. you get this year, and I'm not expecting her to be at grade level at the end of the year, like, I'm not, and also letting the teachers know that, like, I, I know as a teacher, it's really important for you to feel like you see progress. Like you want to measure it and test it and assess it and all these other things. I'm like, I need you to not forget that she takes in so much more than she will ever be able to put back out for you. You have to believe she's learning and you have to move forward with optimism in that and not get discouraged because you feel like you can't see your results. Hmm. I'm like, you know, and it's, I just want them to know that it, it's okay to feel discouraged and know that they're not disappointing me. All right. The only thing that would disappoint me is if they didn't try. Hmm. Or if they said, well, we're not going to move on to B because we can't be for sure that she's mastered A. Right. You know, the, the number of student, teachers who've come in and been like, let's identify letters. I'm like, she's been identifying letters since she was six. She's done, right? She's not going to do it for you anymore. She's going to stare at you. Yeah. If, she, if her device was working properly, she'd be telling you to F off, right? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> um, she, she doesn't want to do that. But they need proof for them that she's mm-hmm. learned it. And I'm like, you're going to have to assume that she's learned some things and you're going to have to move forward. Mm. And when they do that, she'll, she will work with them. You know, she's written some really nice reports on books that they've read and things like that using her communication device. They're mm-hmm. simple. Like, don't, I don't want people in the audience to be like, oh, her kid writes reports. No, I mean, like, like they'll use things in like, what did you like the most about this character? And she'll choose like handsome and strong. That's great. Okay. Yeah. So they'll write that down, right? You know, they'll help her model it. Um, but a kid who's doing that doesn't want to identify her letters, right? So um, trying to make sure that the, the team pushes and feels comfortable pushing too. That's great. Is, is good. They need permission. Yeah, absolutely. What else? I, um, I'm school-based part-time, so I work for them um, as an assistant technology specialist. I always my intro. <laughs> um, I wear a couple different hats. That is one of them. And I, I will say that there are, when it comes to like working with teams, I think that this empowerment is a really important word. And I, I, I've heard kind of iterations of that. But last year there was a um, Aaron and Rachel Lightning and Marlon Cummings and I did a session on breaking down barriers to AAC implementation. And it was, you know, it was a, it was a pre-conference. It was a full day, tons of information. But one of the most important things that we kind of landed on in terms of our discussion was the, um, the value of allies and figuring out who your allies are within your child's team. So maybe it's the para, maybe it's the teacher, maybe it's the director or the principal or whomever, but figuring out who that ally is 
and, and, and really kind of figuring out how they can leverage their resources, whether it's influence or whether it's staffing or whether it's the opportunity to seek out training. You know, there's not a there's not a direct path because so much of this work is not just about the doing, but about how it feels to do mm. and about who can support you to do it better mm. and how that kind of plays into the team support. Um, I think in general, teams do need a lot of support in order to do the job as well as possible and to be a part of that team and help teams figure out their own allies, I think is a really important part of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. I love that idea of finding allies. I think that is such a strong point. Thanks for bringing that up. Karen or Carol, would you like to add anything? You know, I'll chime in one strategy that I've seen, you know, kind of work um, for some families that um, I've been connected with. And that is, you know, to kind of think about the fact that, you know, the teams are as different as our kids are, mm. right? And so, you know, to spend a little bit of time when you're with a new team, kind of taking stock, you know, kind of like observing them, seeing what they're about, you know, just because, you know, just like we want um, people to work with our kids from a point of strength, right, to work on, you know, work from their point of strength. I think the same thing sometimes for teams, you know, mm -hmm. so, you know, just try to size up, you know, who's a little bit resistant and where does that come from? Who's good at what, right? So that as things come up where you need help problem solving or with implementation, you can toss it to the person who's really ready for it, mm -hmm. you know, even though that may not be the person with the right title that you think that that query would go to. Interesting. So anyway, just a thought. No, that's great. Karen, anything? Yep. Um, I mean, I really appreciate all of everybody's insights and suggestions. We've, we've done a lot of those same things. One like concrete strategy that we were able to do this past school year, which made a tremendous difference for us is uh, we we agree like meeting as a team is uh, incredibly precious time, and we were able to I think you know largely because we were virtual for the entire school year, um, we were able to meet every once a week for a half an hour, um, and just have a check in as a team. What's going well? What's not? What's coming up for next week? How do we do some like planning and forecasting? What's ahead? And for us, um, you know, it was not only, I mean, this past year was just an insight into what happens in school generally um, in a way that we hadn't had before, because I was, I was there being Nico's, uh, being Nico's aid every day, um, in addition to his aid who was on camera, you know, on, on one Zoom and as class who was on another one. Oh. Uh, and so, uh, you know, so that that time getting as much sort of regular scheduled time with the whole with the team, um, especially like folks in the classroom and related service providers, that was just so great to have. Yeah. Um, and, and really would recommend folks trying to get that in um, as, as best you can with folks or with whoever you can get in, like, from the allies perspective to be in that with you. I think that's a great point. I know that, um, you know, last year we were dealing with, we have an outside speech therapist and an in-school speech therapist. So he does extra speech therapy outside. And our speech therapist outside was saying like, he's just doing so good. He's doing A, B, C, and D. And then within the school, they were like, we're just having a lot of challenges. And so in my mind, I'm like, where's the disconnect here? And so, you know, I think that what I, the point I want to make here is that don't be afraid to ask your your team you know can we or what if and, and basically what i went to our speech therapist in school and said i know that lamp is what you use for the whole school system i get it and i get that we're trying to adapt jackson to using lamp but that's a that's a particular aac program but he's doing really good with snap core over here like where can we meet in the middle and she was like, well, let me, you know, give me permission to talk to your specialist, your, your outside speech therapist, her and I will work together and we'll figure this out. And I'm like, you can do that? Really? And she's like, absolutely. I'm, I, we want Jackson to be successful. So let's figure this out. And within a week, they, at school, they had changed his program at school. They put him on SnapCore and it was much easier. And it was like night and day. So it's one of those things like, don't be afraid to ask, right? Because, you know, the answer, just because they say in your IEP, this is what we're going to do, it may not work and it may, something may be better. So in, and really quickly reference to Becky, and maybe anyone can answer this within the question box here, 
Becky made a, a, a point about, uh, you know, understanding the knowledge of our individuals with Enderman syndrome. The question is, how can we as parents really know the level of literacy or knowledge our, kid, our kids are really at? Does you, can you want to take a stab at that? I mean, I'll, I, I can take a step from the parent side, but it'd be great to hear what Carol yeah. and Abby have to say with this. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think I can, right? Um, and to be honest with you, I'm not, if someone said to me, like, what do you think the math abilities of your son are? I don't know, right? And, and the only reason I know at all is because he gets a grade from school, right? It's not like I send him down and say, you know, show me how you did this. Um, what someone had recommended, it might've been Aaron a long time ago, was to do portfolio assessment. And so every time Sophie does something that everybody gets really excited about at school, I ask them to please write it down somewhere, right? Mm. Because if you, we actually had this at daycare. They had provided, when she graduated from daycare at five, they handed me a folder and they said, we do this for all the kids. And I had no idea. And in it were all these stickers that said, today, Sophie did this. Today, mm. Sophie did this. We saw Sophie do this for the first time. And I, you know, I sat and cried as I went through and read this because it was five years of all these great, amazing accomplishments. Yeah. But when they happen, they're so fleeting, even with your kid with Angelman Theater, like you're, you're excited and then you're like, what's next? Um, but with the portfolio assessment, like when she, when she helped write, you know, some of these essays for some of these school projects, I had no idea they had done mm. that. Um, so getting to see those, I was like, oh, wow. Okay. So there is more. And I think like Karen was saying too, you know, we had her at home this year and her, we were lucky because her, uh, her nanny got to be her one-on-one -on -one for school. And her nanny knows her really well and could push her. And her school team was like, wow, we had no idea we could push her that hard. And so it was really good for them to see that, you know, she's not the fragile. She does, she does do this a lot. Literally. She will like, oh. <laughs> um, you know, and they're like, oh, she's tired. I'm like, she's not tired. She's a manipulator. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I think just having those moments and capturing them, mm -hmm. you know, has helped me a lot. But I don't know what the pro professionals would say. Like, I don't know if we can assess that. Well, you know, I'll take a stab at this. And, and you know, I, I think, you know, what I'm going to say probably, you know, fits in well with what you, you just mentioned. And, you know, the portfolios are terrific, but sometimes you need to do direct assessments as well to try to get that information. And so, you know, one of the things I think a lot about is, you know, where does the preponderance of the evidence lie, right? So as diagnosticians, right, as teachers, as assessors, we want to know for sure, like, do they or don't they know this thing? Thing. And so, you know, if that's the game we're playing, we're always going to be frustrated if we're looking at, you know, a firm answer. And so, you know, what we have to do, I think, is think about pulling in information from multiple sources, mm. right? Yes, the direct assessment I did, but also something I observed while I was setting up for the direct assessment or something the teacher, you know, told me they could do or mom told me they could do or I saw in the portfolio and not being so constrained to, um, you know, a particular way of doing things, but, you know, kind of having that sort of mental sort of, I don't know, sorting, sorting box, right? Like, so this thing that she did shows me, wow, I think she kind of gets it, right? Mm -hmm. This thing that she did shows me, oh, I really don't think she knows much about that at all. And this part, you know, this category is like, huh, I'm not sure one way or another, right? And so we just keep collecting evidence, putting them sort of into those boxes, you know, and all will be revealed, right? So some sense, you know, kind of emerges out of the mist, sure. you know, over time. Hmm. That's a great, that's good. That's, that's great feedback. I think the one thing that always shocks me, at least from school, I love the idea of keeping a portfolio because I don't know how many times um, something will come home and they'll be like, oh, Jackson, you know, used his fork again today. And I'm like, what? We've never seen him use a fork what? And they're like, oh yeah, he uses a fork all the time at school. I'm like, that little stinker, he's going to do it at school, but he's not going to do it at home because he knows mommy will feed him. So I love that idea, right? Because they sometimes perform for others and they won't for us. So um, so I want to jump into uh, another question really quick, because I we have some families on the phone that may, you know, may have individuals that are a little bit older. They're not, you know, they're not in preschool, just starting this journey, but they have not started their journey and different a different way of you know AAC or communication. 
I, I would love to hear maybe first from Tabby and Carol to talk a little bit about what post-secondary or like, or what it looks like to start this communication journey later on in life. And maybe some like helpful hips and like this can happen, right? It's never too late. So whoever wants to go first. No, for sure. It's never too late. You know, I, I've been doing AAC work since the mid 1980s, right? And one thing that's really changed in the past 30 plus years has been our, our understanding of what kids um, are capable of at different mm. ages, right? When I first started out doing this, we had a view that the communication skills that you acquired within the first decade of life are, are paramount, paramount. And kind of by the time you're 10, you pretty much had done your growing in communication and learning and, and language learning and you know, my first position as a speech language pathologist was with adults with developmental disabilities, intellectual disabilities, and severe behavioral challenges. And it was them that taught me that the textbooks were wrong about this, right? It was Wanda yeah. and Maggie and, and Marty and Doug, you know, and the others who said, you know, this just is not true. The mm. way they progressed with their communication boards, which was pretty much all we had, you know, at that facility, it, it just gave me a very different perspective. Mm. And, you know, what I've learned from, from folks over the, you know, over my career is that these adolescent years, these teenage years, these young adult years, um, they can be an incredibly rich time for, for communication learning. Mm -hmm. So a lot of, you know, um, the young people with whom I've worked, they've made as much progress during adolescence or more than they did when they were preschoolers in terms of communication and language. Because, you know, as in preschool years, you know, you're worried with, about, you know, you know, basic survival, right? Um, and you want them to move, you want them to be able to eat, you want them to be able to sleep, right? You want to know how to deal with their seizures, you know, what mm -hmm. all of these things, right? Uh, you know, take, take your attention, but it also, you know, it takes them a while to grow into their bodies. Mm -hmm. So I would say that, um, you know, it can be a really rich time for, for communication learning. Um, and, you know, just you know, don't don't listen to folks who are trying to convince you that, you know, it might be too late. I mean, I was trying to think as you were talking, Amanda, you know, I think probably the oldest person when I first started them in on the AAC system was in their 50s. Oh, wow. Right? That's they amazing. didn't look yeah. much differently than my elementary kids, yeah. you know? They That's just great. didn't have the chance um, earlier on. So I, I think, you know, um, one of the things is really, you know, that I've come to understand is that their trajectory, trajectory of learning has less to do with who they are as individuals and more to do with the quality and the quantity of the supports they're provided, mm. right? So if the supports come into being when they're 14, that's okay, right? Yeah. That, it yeah. really is. And I'm not saying not to placate anybody. It's just been my experience yeah. that we can get really good outcomes if we can pull things together, you know, during those years. That's that's great advice. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Tabby, did you want to add something? Yeah, I would just say to piggyback on that and give a little bit of perspective. The iPod is only 11 years old. It was only invented 11 years ago and it's revolutionized our lives and it's really had a tremendous impact on AAC because now AAC is really widely available. And we're yes. not going through six month funding processes for thousand dollar devices. It's actually available. So I think that individuals who haven't had the opportunity to learn you know, that access to the tool can, you know, could be a really significant contributing factor. And to say that they did that and it didn't work, we're talking about very different technology than what is currently available. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, mixed within that as well is the fact that technology is, people know technology, it's really intuitive. Um, we understand technology, we can navigate it. When I first started, you know, as an AAC specialist, um, I can remember doing a device training that literally lasted all day because it was so complex and it was so not intuitive. Mm -hmm. Nobody carried it around in the back pocket. So I think that that change kind of, um, the technological advance has um, really impacted the way that we're able to support individuals throughout the lifespan. Um, and I think it's important to recognize that as well. Um, and along, I just want to also add, along with the fact that people have so many more experiences, you know, mm -hmm. as they gain years over year, 
And, you know, that gives them more to communicate about, more relationships to build upon. So, um, you know, there's just, there's so much more to it. There can be, you know, such um, so much richness in within sure. that individual that we can bring out to their team. Oh, that's beautiful. Becky, yeah. I love that you raised your hand, by the way. <laughs> yeah. um, no, I was just going uh, to to remind everybody, too, that um, receptive communication, which is the ability to take in information, is very high in our individuals. Mm -hmm. It's the expressive that's hard, right? Like, because of their motor function, signing is hard, and it's hard to generate speech, and, you know, it's hard to push buttons and things like that, but they understand what you say, right? Mm -hmm. If you said to your son, you know, there's cookies in the ki kitchen, I bet he would go to the kitchen, right? And mm -hmm. And that's a big sentence, right? There's cookies in the kitchen. He knows where the kitchen is. He knows what a cookie is. He knows he needs to go there to get it. There's a lot of information that they take in. So whenever you start with trying to get communication output, you're not mm. like teaching them language from step one. They've got a lot of language. What you're trying to teach them to do is get it back out. Yeah. Great. So, so they're already learning. If you're reading them bedtime stories, you're teaching. If you're talking to them, you're teaching, right? All, all of this is important. This is one small step of communication. Yeah, so, absolutely. So you haven't wasted any, I guess what I'm saying is you haven't wasted any time. They're, they, yeah. they're learning all along. It's yeah. just like Carol said, if you get the right supports and the right tools, things can really take off and that can happen at any time. It's very hopeful. Anyone else want to add to that question? Yeah, well, I'd love to just add to kind of it all. I, I um, at the, the power of peers. I yeah. honestly like, this little girl, Hannah walked into a wrong class in grade one and this grade one kiddo was like, who's that? I want to be her friend. And, you know, I remember grieving of like, would Hannah have neurotypical friends and what would this look like? And yeah. that happened. And I, I pushed myself and I want to push all of you to foster playdates that we all hate, that all take so much effort and exhaustion. Right. But yeah. Uh, Hannah's in grade six now and her and we've moved even in those times but she is the coolest group of friends now and I have them over and sometimes I have them over without Hannah and I say like you guys this is we're Hannah's best advocates like this is what we do for friends and they are the ones that are um, using another device in the classroom they are the ones saying hey Hannah can say this on her device they are the ones that are in some ways, the strongest ones that Hannah's listening to, you know, I always tell them like, I'm super cool. I'm a cool mom. Yeah. <laughs> but Hannah thinks you're cooler. And, and it's reminding everyone that where, where do we learn all the things that we're not supposed to is from our peers, right? Is that belonging when we can, when we have that sense of belonging and friendships and safety, we can learn better. Like we yeah. take more in yeah. and I just in the communication journey, going back to allies of whether it be your school team, but really fostering those friendships, whether you're in a segregated, um, like specialized education class or in inclusive classroom, it doesn't matter. It's still building that community that really is going to help, help you through this journey in this marathon. Absolutely. So I wanted to ask you guys, because this question has come up uh, several times and we get the question at the foundation a lot. And I'd love to hear maybe from the, 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 the I, you all are, you are all experts, but the people, the professionals and the parents, um, we hear a lot of like, uh, should, when should I start speech therapy for my child? It's, you know, I just found out that she, he or she has Angelman syndrome. He or she is 18 want to get them in speech therapy, but I've also have PT, OT, and all this different things. So can you guys maybe talk a little bit about when speech therapy, I, I, and there might not might be a magic answer, answer, but when to start speech therapy with our kids and individuals living with no, I think it has more to do with your readiness than your kids' readiness. Okay. <laughs> right? So, like, you know, we can help kids, you know, from you know um, infancy on, you know, support their communication skills. But it's really, um, it's so much bigger than that. Mm -hmm. And you know, I would love for this to be a situation where kids could improve their, um, you know, language skills just by coming to therapy and nothing else. But it's just really not in the cards. It has to be immersed all day long. And right. that's a big ask. 
And so it really more is, you know, like, when are you ready, right? When can you make room for, for some changes in terms of how you interact and, and bringing in maybe some new tools and strategies? Yeah. Um, there's no such thing as it being too soon for your kid, but there's absolutely a time where it could be too soon for you. And that's fine. Yeah. That's fine. You know, I, I'm thinking of a family that I worked with who, um, you know, had six kids on the spectrum. And, you know, all I could do, you know, is shower every couple of days and, you know, try to keep everybody fed and safe. And so, you know, for them to focus on AEC support strategies, you know, for me to kind of push that for them, it's only going to make them feel guilty about what they're not able to do. And that's not going to help anything, right? That's just a big setback now when they do have the bandwidth for it right? Um, we're just going to have to get over the, the emotional hurdle, uh, you know, from me having made them feel guilty. So I would just say, you know, um, kids will learn when we're ready to teach, you know, just have that sort of heart to heart with yourself and, um, you know, take those steps when you're ready and also be really clear in giving us direction about how much you want, right? Mm-hmm. So like everybody wants the best, right, for their kid, but y- you can be clear with us and say, here's my limit, here's what I can do. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, f- force us to, you know, figure out strategies, approaches, you know, ways of doing this that fit what your parameters are, because every family, you know, is coming at this from a, from a different place. We just I have to have that. these authentic conversations. Yeah, I, I love that, because you're giving them permission to it to be okay to make it make it okay for the whole fan like to be ready Sarah sorry go ahead you yeah I I just want to echo everything that Carol said because we started before we knew Hannah had Angeman syndrome the doctors didn't take me seriously that something was delayed and that and so I had to wait till she was 14 months to kind of go through that milestone of like well they don't all do everything at the same time and I had to personally enroll her in speech and OT and PT myself and for anyone to take me seriously. And honestly, I got nothing out of those sessions. I was just going through the motions of like, I have another therapy session to do. Like I'm exhausted. I'm so tired. I had a new, another newborn. And so I think it like depends on where you are in your journey. Right. And then you kind of take a break for a little bit and you come back to it in a different um, situation. Like, you know, after I went to camp and everything like that changed my perspective tons. And as I've kind of got um, Hannah's peers involved, that changes my perspective of what our speech therapy is. And now um, when we attend speech therapy and my, our vision of AAC and my family is we all attend speech therapy. So Hannah's hour is all of us. And we are all immersed in the AAC and we're all playing games and there's no expectation on Hannah of the hour session. So that also helped me as a parent relax. And I say to other people, like your allies are in your own family, because Mm -hmm. as the primary caregiver, we are doing everything. And, and with a lot of support, it's still exhausting. And so I think like, I need my family to know when I'm down on that bottom, who's going to inspire me to kind of get up again. Right. And, and I did take the thing last year, or this year, when COVID after it already been going on for, you know, a year, I said, we need a break from speech. We're mm-hmm. done. We, we're going to take a break. And it took a lot in some ways to say that. Yeah. But I knew that as long as I could keep the exposure and adventures and fun within our family and more good moments than like not so good moments in COVID, that's what matters the most. And that's the richness. And like my therapist teams are there to support me and go, okay, here's what we're doing this week. And we're just having this fun. Here's our yeah. adventures how can I put a few little things into that and give the permission to parents to say, be a mom too, be a dad, be a caregiver. There's a Have lot. Yeah. Can I add to that, Amanda? Fun. Yeah, please. Um, I wanted to say when, when my daughter was little, parents whose children were older would say to me, you know, eventually you're not going to want a therapy. You're not going to want to be the therapist. You're going to want to be the mom. And I basically wanted to tell all of them, like, shut up. You don't know what I'm doing. You don't know where I am. You're and now that I'm older, I'm like, oh my God, they were so right. And I was so <laughs> and like, um, but you know, you're going to be at different places in your journey at different times. Mm-hmm. And when Sophie was little, we were so consumed with trying to get her not to seize. That was really all we could focus on. We, mm-hmm. you know, to get her to not seize and try to keep our jobs 
and try to get some sleep. That was all we could manage. Yeah. And I was still running her to tons of therapies and she actually got kicked. We got kicked out of physical therapy and I was devastated at the time. But the therapist said to me, like, your child doesn't want to be here. Mm. And I thought, she doesn't have a choice in the matter. And then I thought, wait a minute, I guess maybe she does have a choice. But the only things that she would do at PT, she would be in the swing where she could not see anyone and just be wrapped in the swing. She would do that. Or she would get on the bike and go for the door and hit the door over and over Mm. and over with the bike. It was communication from my child that she did not want to be a PT. Mm. And the PT said, why don't you find something that's meaningful to her, like horseback riding? And I'm like, this kid can't walk and you want me to put her on a horse. And we did. And it was amazing. Mm. And the reason I'm telling that story is if, and, and this is addressing something that was brought up in the chat too, about, you know, SLPs wanting to make things simpler and things like that. If your kid's not motivated to communicate, they're not going to communicate, right? It, it's not like do your math problems. You're going to communicate now. If Sophie's not motivated to say something on that device, she won't. And there are times that she looks at me like, you're supposed to read my mind because you're mom. And I'm not going to use that stupid device with you. Mm. She'll use it at school because they're, you know, they don't understand her, but I'm supposed to. So you have to make it motivational, right? Mm. They have to want to do it. If they don't want to communicate or if they can get their point across by pointing or walking across the room, they're going to point or walk across the room. Who wants to use that stupid thing? Mm -hmm. If, If I could just say, give me that. Why would I sit there and push those buttons? Like, I think we have to remember what communication is for Hmm. so that you can tell somebody something that they don't know. Right. And if I already know the answer, she's not going to use the device to tell me what it was. Right. Absolutely. Those are great. Those are great points. I mean, I think we could sit on this panel all day. We have two minutes left, but I'm going to ask, can you guys stay on a few minutes so I can ask a few questions that have come through? Um, so this one says, what would, we, uh, what would we be working on first with an SLP at 15 months? We have one assigned to our son, but have never had any sessions. Should I be pushing for that? Or is there not much we'd be doing at this age? Anyone want to take a stab at that? Anybody? I, I'm not a professional. I'm not an SLP, but we did start at 15, 14 months, 15 months, and we didn't have a diagnosis of Angelman syndrome. So we didn't actually know if Hannah would talk or where she was at. They thought maybe she had cerebral palsy and mm-hmm. um, kind of there. Um, what they worked on was, it was just play-based at that time. So I personally think like if you have the capacity to do it, I think it's a beautiful way to start a relationship and to get exposure into um, so many different um, perspectives into your world. And there's no harm in it. I, I honestly, if you have the capacity, go for it, do it and create your team and build that ally into someone who can help support you into the spaces you want to be. I would just add to that that the model for early intervention is a coaching model. So that okay. individual is going to be providing you information about what to expect and what communication looks like at that age and what kinds of play-based strategies are going to help elicit that. And knowing the profile of individuals with Angelman syndrome and the need for AAC down the road, they're going to start talking to you about AAC and mm-hmm. what it looks like and what it is and what some of those foundational understandings are. Um, you might start to explore your options. I mean, children as young as 18 months have had, you know, devices provided. So I think that um, it may not be that there's a lot of interaction with this child per se, but really providing you information and coaching you to interact with your child in such a way to support that receptive and expressive language growth and development. I love that. Thank you for that addition. So I'm going to ask Karen this question. Sorry, I'm going to put you on the spot only because when I think of you and think of the work that you've done with your family, I I truly envision you as an advocate. And so I wanted to ask you, um, you know, one of the questions that came out in the the chat box was was talking about uh, more of how do you advocate to make sure that people who are working with our individuals, whether it's at a group home, at school or whatever, advocate for them to have their devices or have what they need. I think the question is more so related to the device, but maybe talk a little bit about that if you wouldn't mind. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, uh, so um, thank you for thinking of me as an advocate. Um, I, it's, uh, you know, we all um, do 
what we can to try to help our kids and help ourselves as much as possible. I, the question, I think your question is so, so great um, uh, about sort of how do we get, make sure that the kid has access to the device. And, I, you know, our experience, as you saw the picture of Nico at the beginning, he wears his talker on a harness. Um, it's with, so as long as we, I mean, he can take it off now. Um, he's gotten good at doing a, taking it off move, um, even though it's buckled on, it's fine. <laughs> um, uh, but so having that sort of that goes with him to school, it goes with him everywhere. Um, and, you know, we were able to just set that as the expectation. And as far as breaking it, um, he was broken, his, he was broken a lot of iPads, um, but his talker while he was wearing it only once. Um, and, uh, that was on a piece of playground equipment that he leaned on too hard. Um, and so I just think, you know, to me, the question is less about like, will it break and more about, um, will he be able to say something yeah. that's going on for him? Right. And having multiple devices really helps in the question of what happens when it breaks or having a, a light tech backup is really key for that as well. Um, so we have a, 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 the, a printout of the homepage for Nico's uh, AAC that we sort of, we laminate, we have in the bath, we have extra copies, we take to the beach or the pool or wherever. Um, but we also have it, we also have that as a backup in case oh, we don't have uh, the iPad handy or if it breaks or something like that. So that there is something there. So yeah. sort of taking away that question about what if it breaks, well, we have this backup. Um, and that's what, what's, you know, what we're really trying to do is make sure that they've got what they need. If you do have access to school, um, you know, you can try to get a school-based device, a school a device funded from the school district. And we have another, you know, we have a, a device that we've purchased as well, another iPad. Um, and, and uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, costs with, associated with that. And we know that the ASF Family Fund yes. will help to fund that. Thank um, you. So if that's your sort of like <laughs> yep. thing holding you back um, and you've got a device from school, but you want another device, um, you know, go to the Family Fund because it's, it's so great for us to see Nico's ownership of his own device. Um, and he also uses the sort of modeling talker that we carry around um, as a strategy to communicate mm. who he wants to be his support person, right? So like if I'm wearing, you know, I'm his support person and then dad comes home, he takes the talker off of me and puts it on dad to be like, wow. okay, I'm ready for dad. <laughs> yes, I love that. <laughs> That's amazing. And all of that stuff is really just about thinking about how's he got more control over it, right? Because at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is have him have some ownership over what he wants to say, when he wants to say it, and how he wants to say it. Yeah. Um, and getting the rest of the team that whoever, wherever you are working on it, to be with you around that um, really can help because we all know that, you know, I, I like, I think about part of what we're doing around device use is trying to help Nico be able to talk to, unfamiliar people, unfamiliar mm -hmm. communication partners, right? We know what Becky said is totally true for Nico too. Um, if if he he knows that I can understand a lot more of his signs, gestures, and points and grunts than most people. So he's less likely to use his device with me, but we're right. trying to sort of model that, say back to him what he said to us so that he can in a novel situation where he we're not there, for whatever reason, like he can get that point across to somebody and that's what's really key. And that's what we try to hold and share with the team in what, what other folks have said around sort of like doing that team building, getting to know you, helping set the stage with, yeah. with the team and what's going on, taking the step back to say, what are your goals here? What are our goals here? How are we working together around all this? Absolutely. And I think it's like really saying like, what's our role in it, right? Like yeah. Hannah wore her device for five years. Now she's going to junior high and she's like, no. Yeah. So we, I got a new phone and I put it on her phone because that's what's cool now in junior high. And she, you know, she has that she access, she can do it, but it was powerful. And when her peers use it, whether they're using a core board or they have a device, she's more likely to use it. Like, that's what's been motivating for her is like seeing other people use it and normalizing that. She's like, okay, yeah, I can do yeah. that. I can talk. So I think it's like following your kid's lead 
we had to really kind of let go of the harness and go, okay, what's our next step? Where is she now? And, yeah. and that's kind of where the a phone came in for us. And hopefully she doesn't phone 911 or anything. Right. Well, that's okay. Right. At least she <laughs> knows how to. Right. So, okay. Yeah. So I hate to, I hate to cut the panel short, only not short, but to go over um, because we, we have our closing remarks that need to happen soon here. So I just wanted to um, say, say thank you to Carol, Sarah, Karen, Becky and Tabby, what a great session. There's some questions still in the Q&A box, but as we've promised everyone, we will make sure we will get with you personally and get these questions answered that have been asked throughout the week. But I hope you guys enjoyed this session and thank you guys for your amazing um, dedication to the community and for all the information that you've been able to give us today. So thank you guys. We hope you have a great Saturday and we'll talk to you guys soon. Thank you, panelists, you're amazing.